Eckstein Gemende <laughs> in Berlin. And that church has really been growing. And uh, Christian also helps with the European Bible Training Center, which actually has numerous locations in Germany, but even throughout Europe, Switzerland, and uh, there's, yeah, Austria. Wow. Just, it's expanding. In fact, every time I get an update from you, Christian, I'm just amazed to hear just how the ministry is being used there, just all the fruit God's giving you. It just makes me wonder, man, is Germany still dead? <laughs> but I know there's still a lot of work to do. I mean, even this past year, he was saying how EBTC, the school there, close to a thousand new students, right? Just added throughout Europe, at least. And it's just amazing what God is doing over there. And, but not only is God growing the church over there, but even some additions to the family. <laughs> a new granddaughter and new son-in-law. So a lot of excited th exciting things going on in Christian's life, and we're, we're just excited to hear more about it this morning. Brother, come up here and preach the word to us. Love you, brother. <laughs> and how do I do this? So this is... Just to go right. Perfect. So just that one and back. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you all. That's great. Um, uh, wow. This was probably the worship center, and now it's a Sunday school. It shows also something. You're growing. So I'm very excited. Yes, we are very grateful, Sean and I, to be here. We are already in the country since the 22nd of December, uh, uh, not December, sorry, of February. Uh, we decided to come. Anyway, even so, they said not to come if you're not an American citizen, but since I'm married to an American citizen, I was allowed to come in. But then when we were in Frankfurt, I just tell the story so you know why we are here. I came uh, in Berlin at the airport very early in the morning. We went to the counter and said, oh, here's my paperwork, everything is okay, yes. Where's your marriage certificate? I said, what do you need? Marriage certificates, I don't have it. Okay, you, we can let you fly to Frankfurt, maybe they let you through. So we went to Frankfurt, came to the counter, marriage certificate. We went to the, we, I didn't have a boarding ticket, my wife did. And so, um, 10 minutes before the flight, I finally let us through. I did have the marriage certificate on my hand, hand my, uh, my cell phone showed it to them. But the point is, it's getting difficult to come into this country. So I'm thankful to be here. <laughs> Um, anyway, I just wanted to give you, some of you know us, Sean and myself, we have been part of um, your um, extended ministry, I should say, over 24 or 5 years. Altogether, we are over 30 years in the ministry. And so we thought that we give you a little overview of what we did in the last year. So uh, I just built it up on the, um, ish, the reporting issue. I wanted to report back as it says in Acts 21 and maybe you can open your Bibles um, where it says that when missionaries come back to the, um, the church where they were sent out in um, Acts 21 17 here Paul comes back to Jerusalem and he says the following after we arrived on Luke is it me sorry maybe that's this I don't know um, after we arrived in Jerusalem the brethren received us gladly and the following following day Paul went in with us to James and all the other the elders were present after he had greeted them he began to relate one by one the things which God has done among the Gentiles through his ministry and when they had heard it they began glorifying God and they said to him you see brother how many thousands there are among the Jews those who have believed and they all uh, and they are all zealous for the Lord or for the law. Anyway, it is important for us to understand that our duty also as missionaries is to come back and to report what God has done. And I have to admit, 
he has done amazing things and we are very grateful for that. And I just wanted to go back. Um, is this, how do you do this? I probably, oh, I probably have to do this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. This is, this is, when we first sent, were sent out, it looks a little bit different. Yeah. Shell and I were sent out on the three and a half years internship. So we didn't go to the field as missionaries right away. We were interns for three and a half years. That was the second picture shortly afterwards when we were uh, preparing to go um, to, um, we came back here and the first child in Germany, I think. Then the, that was our picture, probably when you remember us, where we were sent out in 97, our, ch our duty, what we were sent out by Grace Community Church in partnership with CBC, and then church planting was what we were supposed to do, training center, uh, developing church-based training center, leadership training, and publishing ministry. That was what we were sent out to do in that time. That's another picture a few years later as a family in Jerusalem on a trip um, at the... Uh, different gates. That was just last two years ago, the wedding of my son Philip. It looks such family has grown even since then, having a qu quite a few more grandchildren. That's us. That's uh, my son-in-law with Katrina and the kids uh, who moved rest right now back to the States to join and help the TMI, the training centers in around the world right, uh, from here. Then that's Stephanie and Daniel and their three kids, just a recent picture of them. So we are also growing in that sense. Then my son, Philip and Heather, with her youngest daughter, and just a joy, just a recent picture from last week. And my Elizabeth and Jonathan, who just got married in January. And that was, it doesn't look that way, but it was really cold. <laughs> I, I you know she had, uh, they tried to, manipulate her fingers a little bit, they were more or less blue at that time. Uh, and then this is what we are right now, Our ch my church, my time is basically divided by those ministries here, divided between church, EBTC, European Bible Training Center, TMI European Training Centers in Europe, where I'm shepherding them as much as I can, as well as the European GMI missionaries. I'm not doing that alone, don't worry. I'm doing that today together with great Greg White from Ukraine, but all this, that's kind of our emphasis at the moment, the, the church, the Eckstein Gemeinde. Then this is what happens over the years when we say, talk about God allowing us to see the fruit of the ministry over the years, the enrollment at the training centers. At that time was Zurich and uh, Berlin, but a few years later, then in 2011, 2016, we uh, even went to Rhineland, which is near Köln and Vienna and Austria, and now we have a kind of attendance of over 300 students in the different places doing the um, year physical students, but we have also online students, which are not represented. We, all these are the programs which are going, are done through the European Bible Training Center at the present time. The latest, we added the music ministries, a one-year program, and also the Mass of Divinity, which we added, I think, four years ago. It's a six-year bivocational program. Really nice to have that for the students. That's some of the classes, which they are small, they are, um, but this is where I teach probably biblical counseling in the classes. That's a little bit larger class in Switzerland and in the Rhineland, uh, the latest. Well, I haven't been very often in the last years because as we have added so many more teachers and locations. We were also involved in publishing, and that was something what we are doing over the years. Maybe just going back, we have, I think, started many, many books, and the latest book was The Doctrines of uh, Grace, I think, from John MacArthur, and uh, we have, uh, right now, we are working on our own books from one of our faculty, uh, Benedict Peters, who's writing a biblical theology of the years, which is really great to have it in German, obviously, by one of our professors. And this is our team in Berlin. 
the families, uh, we got together, usually once a year I have a family day and just work and has, that has grown too. Previously we were a couple of guys or three guys with the families, now this is the team, the EBTC team, representing also five different churches. So this is kind of the Italian ministry with TMAI, the, all, all the, the different ministries, different training centers and here you can see where we are all located and allowed to minister together with people. Cheryl, his, her ministry is a lot with the children and, uh, and also uh, the women in the church. This is a mother's child class once a week where we, they gather together and reach out and train basically the young ones and the parents or the mothers. Here, newborn last year, we had quite a few births in the church. It's also a church growing that's really nice and lately the baptism where I was allowed on the right hand, upper right hand corner to baptize my own daughter a few years ago. That was a joy just to see that and the women of our church. That just gives a glance what just happened. Can you turn off the PowerPoint, please? Thank you. Um, because I don't have printed documents, I want to talk to you about today, about the opportunity to, um, to really, what it does it mean to become a missionary, or what does it take to be a missionary? Uh, as I understand, um, you have, um, I just have to open my computer here. You have um, had the Missions Week, and our focus, um, and my focus is also today, especially to talk about what it takes to be a missionary. And um, I'm just. So, just a second. And. And I started that because it's important for us to remember that we have to, as a missionaries, we want to always report back what God has done because we only can do it because you are supporting us. You are uh, behind us. You are on, on the, the churches here in the United States, or especially uh, uh, CBC is able, has been able to support us over the last 20 plus years and uh, we see all that what you saw just now is not a testimony of what I did or what we did. It's a testimony of what you did, what you were involved in. And it's very important to re recognize it. I would agree with Paul when he said, what do you have that you did not receive? I received everything. If then you received it, why do you boast if, it, if you did not receive it? Um, so... Just to remember, when I'm sharing here, I'm not sharing to make our ministry great and show you the incredible things, what has been done through us, but it's really what God has done. And it's amazing. It just, you just have to think, all that what you saw there is because of faithful support and prayer support and help over the years. I can tell you so many stories where I talked to the men here, the leadership here, who have counseled us, helped us, start with Steve Fernandez where he said, Christian, how is your preaching? And he said, your preaching has to get better. You have to pray for it, and so on and so on and so on. Where he went, helped me to go through difficulties in the ministry and said, you know, focus on Christ, focus on Christ's glory and all those things. I just want to make sure that you understand that you're part of it. We are not, we don't do it in isolation, the ministry. And that is important for us to understand. The truth is we are all sent out as missionaries to fulfill a task. We have a task, and that is what we do. When we do it, it is exp it's because and when we experience the fruit in the ministry, it's only because we do our duty. It's not because, you know, sometimes every missionary sometimes can say, wow, it's so difficult in our place. Well, that's why we go there. It is difficult in the place where we go. I mean, I'm not sending, I'm not myself going to places where it's easy. Why should I go there? Why should I share the ministry in a place where the ministry is already, where the gospel is already taken? I go to the places where the gospel is not, where it's difficult, where it's most difficult. 
And that is in Germany, you think, well, the Reformation was there 500 years ago, but it's the most atheistic country presently, or five years ago, was a study done by the Chicago University, and they said it's the most atheistic place on the planet, the place where we are. So it's a kind of, you have to re, a, re, a new reformation has to be started, and everything has to start anew, and that is where you have been partnering with us and helping us. So when we report back, we want to tell you what God has done, how he has changed the ministry. Uh, and so that is why it's for us important to understand when we go anywhere, it's our duty. It's how and, and our duty and part of how to reach the whole world. We start as in Acts 1, 8, where it says, you know, that we, the disciples were sent out to reach all the regions of the world and, and uh, to the end of the earth. And this is actually what we want to do and where we are part of. And however it's accomplished, of course it's a gospel ministry, of course the centrality of the word is important, but besides that, it's also training men, it's starting churches, it's publishing ministry, it's everything involved in that. And, we, and you understand that, and you understand why that is so important. So our focus in Germany right now is equipping men for the ministry. And, but what, does it, what is necessary for a family to be equipped as a missionary to serve in a local church ministry in a foreign country? That's a big question. I hope some of you here will be ultimately some days on the mission field or send out missionaries and where you're convinced that's the right person or pray for them or financially support them. And you might be missionaries in your own country, on your own neighborhood, but the point is what does it take to become that kind of person? What is necessary for anyone to, of you to, to become a servant in a foreign country? Uh, how can I get ready? What does it take? What should I even get ready to? How should I get even be ready to go? What, what do I need to do? The truth is not all of us should go. You have to understand, not all of us should go. Not everyone is able to be and gifted to do the work of the missionary and the church planter. That's not everybody. You might like that, you might like to think that way, but it's not true. It's not happening. But every one of us should know and be aware what it takes to do the ministry God has asked him to ask his church to fulfill. So we, we need to understand, we need to be educated to understand what it takes to go on the mission field. It is, it is important. So CBC is a missionary sending church and um, you have I know you have been involved in sending missionaries all over the world, and, it's, and it is good for all of you to know what it needs to take place to put a missionary on the field. And it's a huge investment. It's really a huge investment. I just want to make sure, I mean, some of us have, besides the normal education, what you have generally, you have additional 10 or more years of education, education and training before you are sent to the field. So you want, to be, you want to understand what part you're playing in the whole thing. And you want to know what is, is done in order to reach the end of the earth as the world. How do you do it? What is the system of it? And um, that is very important. And you as a church uh, have been part of it since we were sent out in 1997. So church planting is one of our duties and Bible training, what I, church based Bible training and publishing. That was what we were doing. But what does it take then ultimately to go on the mission field? Well, one of the points, and I give you five points which are necessary to put a missionary on the field, basically, or what a missionary, what it takes to be a missionary on the field. First, the necessary preparation for the ministry. You need training. You definitely need training and systematic training. Second, you have some, you have, as a missionary, you have objectives as a pioneer missionary. And usually a missionary should be a pioneer missionary because he starts usually new work in some way or form. It might be not in an unreached country, but it might be in a country where there's no gospel presentation, or in the place at least there's no gospel presentation. Then obviously he needs to be ready to face the obstacles on the field. He needs to expect 
that there are obstacles on the field. And that's what most missionaries are not ready for. I said they are trained, they have the best training, they know what they want to do and what they want to do, but they are not ready to face the obstacles which are coming at them. For instance, education of your kids in the public school system, which is not, uh, you know, it's not a school system that is secular. How do you deal with it? You have no, there's no law. You are not allowed in most of the countries to do public, uh, to private school, to do homeschooling. So how do you deal with it? Would I be willing to go there in that country and do it? What is with the language acquisition? Do I understand the people well enough that, they un that I can present the gospel or deeper studies? All those kind of questions. There are a lot of obstacles. And what is usually where you go, you have opposition. People don't want to hear the gospel. You know that, right? People don't want to hear the gospel. You go in enemy territory. It's like a warrior. You go into a war zone. And what are the unique opportunities as a missionary? And you want to see those unique opportunities when you get them and you're in front of, confronted with them. You want to take advantage of them. And then the ultimate thrills of missionary work is what you have seen in the back. And how it is a thrill to even see fruit in the ministry. Some people have never seen that. Some people have never seen much fruit. So what is the necessary preparation for, minister, for a missionary to go on and be trained? He needs to be a prototypical person of what we want to teach. He needs to, be, he needs to live what he teaches and what he, the others want to, need to learn. He needs to be a prototype, a Christ-like person. You know, when you go to the mission field to start something from ground zero, how do you start a ministry from zero? From nothing. I mean, you just know the gospel, you have the Bible, you go out with, this, with the Bible and you say, okay, what do you do? You relate what's in the scripture by preaching, teaching the gospel, but also by living the gospel. You the, your life has to match what you teach. And this is what I mean. They need to be they need to reflect Christ in their life. And let, and let them also be tested as in 1 Timothy 3, verse 10. He needs to be approved by the church. If you send somebody out, you won't have him approved here in the church. Everybody will say, yes, we want to send him. It's our best person. It's our best family. It's the best we have. We want to send him out because we want to see that other people model what he is or what they are in their church life, in their family life, in their spiritual behavior. And they need to just, they need to be persons who are led by the Spirit because they have really captured the Word of God into their own life and they are led by the Spirit because the Spirit has something to work with in their life because they know the Word of God. I'm doing, and Sharon and I are involved in biblical counseling and we are sometimes we get people into the, our counseling program, they say, well, we want to know, tell me how to do counseling. You know, explain it how to do, and we give them all the different uh, classes and courses, but the ultimate thing is, every biblical counselor needs to know the Bible. If they don't know the Bible, how can they be, be, counsel them biblically? And the difficulties is very often, we, uh, we sometimes try to d tell them and explain them, a system how to do it, but we, it comes down to the uh, point that they have to know what they teach and what they are convinced about. They can know all kinds of different systems, but it doesn't help them if they don't know the Bible. This is with a missionary the same thing. You can't expect a missionary to do something on the field what he hasn't done here. And when he doesn't know the Word of God and doesn't model what you want to promote, the gospel, he shouldn't be on the field. And that comes down even to the leading, how does he lead his family? It is a priority for our lives to disciple our kids and grandkids and be a testament to, your, to the parents, siblings, and even grandparents. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 5 says, For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the God's church? 
It's very simple. It's very simple. And what he doesn't do here, in this ministry, why should he do it somewhere else? It's, why should he go do it somewhere else? And so that, that is, and, and in the foreign country where he would be a missionary, it's even more challenging because he probably faces obstacles of why do you educate your children this way? Why do you train your children this particular way? Most of the European countries are very, very liberal. They are very liberal. And you have to say what, well, you have to convince them and show them why it's important to be biblical and to uh, train your kids the way you do it and handle your family the way you do it. Secondly, he needs, to, he needs to understand the church inside out. I mean, he needs, needs to know everything about the church. He needs to live church. And you're all convinced, right, that the local church is the body how God will reveal his, God's the gospel to other people and plan new ministries. It's through the church. It's through the local church. He needs to be a church man, love the church, understand the church, it's organism, not its organization. I'm not talking about organization. I'm not talking about you have plans how to build a church. I mean, this building is great. But the reality is, if it wouldn't be here, would you meet? Of course you would meet, right? You will meet somewhere. At a lake, in the forest, wherever. You would meet because you're the church. You're an organism. It doesn't matter whether there's a building. And with COVID, we all know of the pandemic, what is, can the government ch close down the church? No, they never can. They never could because it's, it's an organism. It's, we, we belong together. We love each other. We care for each other. In 1 Timothy 3.15, he says, if I, delay you to, uh, uh, if I delay, you may know how, to, uh, how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a but rest of the truth. So he, Paul even in, understands and, and, and shared that with Timothy and understand that, you know, when you go as a missionary or as an ambassador of Christ, the first thing is you need to establish a church and you need to know how to do that. And I'm right now involved in different uh, advising different church plants in Europe because as my new responsibility as a shepherd for the missionaries in, from GMI in Europe, I'm, that we have quite a few church planters. And so for my, I'm saying, you, some of them say I have a church because they have a name, they have a building, and they meet together for preaching. But I said, that sounds good, but that's not quite a church yet. Have you made any disciples? Uh, is a biblical leadership. Is a, you know, the discipleship ministry is the first thing you need to do. You need to make disciples. And God, you know, you, that's, you, it's not in your power really to make disciples, except God is giving you disciples. So you have to be on your knees all the time, and you have to share the gospel and reach out to the people, to the lost, and really penetrate the, the kingdom of the world with the kingdom of light. So that has to be. You have to, that man has to be a churchman. The man who is a missionary, he needs to be, have a good t testimony in public. He needs to be without blame. The, the only blame he should receive from the public is what the Anabaptists and the Puritans were accused of. A moral and pure life clean speech, no drunkenness. They were blameless. And there was, therefore, the people in the public felt guilty and convicted with their own life and wanted to know what the difference is and wanted, had questions about their life. It needs to be that, that way that people come to, know, come to you and say, why is this so different? Why are your children obeying you? Why, why are you not in the pubs at, in the evenings? Why, why do you sing the songs? Why do you be on your knees? And all these kind of things. Why do you read the same book all the time? 
Why is it so flattered? Why, you know, this is the English Bible. I use the German Bible, so don't, uh, this is pretty new still. But the point is, you know, I, have, I do have an excuse why this is not flattered yet. But the point is, what I used to do every 10 years, I give the Bible to somebody else from the family because they want to see my notes in the books. And I said, I, I'm ready with it anyway. I can take the next Bible and make my notes. But the point is, what, the people have this question and you can answer them because this is where life is. This is where I live from. This is what I want to do. And this, his public life is basically, he, is, he sticks out. He's different. And then his inner life. His inner life, his mind, his heart is focused on Christ's glory, not on man's achievement. He is himself as a he sees himself as a servant, as a slave who is under obligation because he loves the Lord and wants to serve him as he serves the church. In Mark 10, I, one of my loving, I love this passage, is Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and Paul's response to this kind of attitude is, I am under, in first Romans 1, verse 14 and 15, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He feels obligated. This inner life, he is so convinced he has to do it. He wouldn't do it otherwise. He's not in it for gain. Sorry, I have to say, I see many missionaries who try to be with one, one foot in the world and one foot in, uh, or, or, and with Christ, so to speak, because they, they do enjoy the life where they are so much that they take more advantage, advantage than they should. And I know, I'm, myself, I'm tempted to do that too. We have great restaurants in Berlin. I like to eat it every day in another one if I could. But that's not the goal. <laughs> and I try to, and, and people who know me know, understand that I try to bring hospitality within the training center, a lot of hospitality, because I want personality in the training center. I eat with the students, I eat with my staff. One, twice a week we, have, we eat lunch together. Why? Because I want to know them. Want, but it's not because we want to eat this great food, but it's mainly because I want relationships. I want to disciple them. I teach them what to eat, really. I do. How to behave in public. Um, how to dress. All those kind of things. It seems like that should be happening in the family, but some people didn't get it in the family. So what am I doing? I disciple them in every aspect. Lastly, he should be a good learner and a good teacher. So when he arrives to the field, First task is to learn the language and learn the culture, if he is not a national. Obviously, for me, it was easy, but for my wife, it was difficult. I had to make sure that Cheryl learned the language and the culture, and I had to expose her. And I mean, she was exposed naturally, but exposed in such a way that she would learn it and she would grow in it. For most of us, it is humbling and challenging time because we are treated as little children in that time. Because if people think you don't understand, therefore you really, maybe you don't even, they didn't realize they come from a country where you do understand, but here you don't understand, so they treat you as a child. And this is sometimes very humbling when you have a master's of biblical, whatever, a master of divinity or THM or doctor or whatever, and suddenly you're treated as a child. You can't even use what you have learned. Think about this. Then you have to get used to a new value system. They drive on the wrong side, Lloyd, people. <laughs> and the, the system is not like, it's like orderly. In Germany, it's very orderly. Everybody says, who comes to order, oh, I love the Autobahn because they always, they pass up on the left side and then drive to the right. And then, so everybody can pass. And here you, ee, 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 you go through all, I mean, this is America. Think about India, I think it's even more exciting. And then you go to France, when you drive around the Arc de Triomphe, you can basically set stand off the Arc de Triomphe. I just give this illustration and watch 
half an hour and you see two accidents and they just pull the cars out because if this is probably tourist i want to drive through the around the arc de triumph and see what's going on there and then suddenly bang you know it's it's just you have to get used to the shopping is different shopping is different education for your kids is different very different it's all wrong what they teach it's all wrong system no it's a different system nothing is wrong it's just different get used to it cost of living is too high think of living in tokyo you don't live in a big house you live in a small apartment if you can afford that or london where it costs like a room i think it's like 250 dollars a week a little room without a bath and things like this i'm just saying that different prices maybe it's the same here already i don't know uh, some things are more expensive others are cheaper so all that a new language that's that you know when when you have a new language it's, you really feel like you don't um, really understand and a lot of missionaries give up within the first term of their stay in four years because what you know what the argumentation is i want to shepherd the people and i seem i can't do it because i can't communicate to them i can't tell them and so what they say is I can be more effective if I go to my language group. And they fail. And I had a few testimonies of that in Europe. And then I talked to the people who they were ministering to, and they said, oh, they were so great. They helped us so much. But now they are gone. They didn't realize how the testimony of even learning a language, a culture, is a testimony to the people in the country because the effort you take in order to share with them something what's on your heart, the gospel, makes such a big testimony. And they, they read it wrong, they understand it wrong because they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the language. And a lot of people leave in the first four years. That's a sad story of it, but it, it always happens. I believe we all expect that from a man and a family that is sent to the... To, out to serve on the mission field that they they are examples of character model and to model after they need to be something party who we can model after and that is so they have to do all as a family as a church and public their inner life everything and also in their teaching and learning and there is a verse which makes it very clearly that is also the expectation of the bible the expectation of the Bible is that you have uh, that the leaders are people who you can model your life after. Hebrews 10, uh, 13, 7. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember the leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. That's expected. They speak the word of God every time. Consider the outcome of their, their way of life. So it means you should observe them and imitate their face and imitate their face not imitate everything what they bad things they do but imitate their face how did they walk by face but again that is not all what a missionary is qualified elders uh, uh, the qualification what a missionary needs in order to be a missionary he needs also to understand he has objective as a pioneer missionary. He needs to be everything what he needs to do is Bible based, spirit driven for the glory of God and out of inner personal conviction. It needs to be something what he has himself embraced and done. He has to, this conviction cannot change. It needs to be Bible based. A lot of missionaries have changed. A philosophy while they're on the field because they say oh that doesn't work they were not patient enough they didn't trust the bible they didn't trust god and they changed and they come up with very weird philosophies and theologies and and ended up in a very wrong place and didn't really uh, represent christ in that region because they were just um, pragmat pra pragmatic driven they wanted to have results but results are not coming because what you do, it's because what, well, to a certain extent, what you do, but because God is blessing you. 
So when we, um, that's also when we went to Germany, um, let's say I would plan, I want to plan a church in Germany. How do we do that? What does it look like? You know, how are we starting a ministry in a, in a country, for me it was not cost culture, but when we went to the inner city, it was a different culture. The first 12 years, Sharon and I worked in the Russian-German church. We are not Russians, we are not Slavic background. And yet we worked there and we, had a, we, we ourselves had to always learn new things about the Russian culture in that context. And lots of people came in from different Sla Slavic countries and that church grew a lot and uh, we needed to um, understand them in order to minister to them and reach them. But when we went to the inner city, the first thing what I did is I did a demographic study. Sounds crazy, but I did. I wanted to know who I w should reach, who are the people where I'm moving to. And I found out there are, there are over 200 different language and culture groups in that area in Berlin. So to start a German church, German-speaking Berlin at church, would be nonsense. I mean, you can do it, but you wouldn't have many people. So when we reach out, we obviously reach out and we're thinking about a multi culti church, multi-language church, that's going to happen. Well, it really did, did happen. We have so many different language groups. On a given Sunday, we, had, we have so many people represented from different countries, from South Africa, from, actually from India, from Pakistan, from, Jew, uh, from Israel, from, um, uh, from you, uh, all the Slavic countries, most of the Slavic countries. Also some Germans, yeah, we have some Germans. Uh, and then also, you know, Americans. And, and uh, so it's very typical that we have to translate our sermons into English. Yeah, into English, not into, you know, German is a local language for us and we do it into English, second language. And sometimes even some people translate into Spanish because we have so much, many Spanish speaking people. So we have to make sure we, uh, we, when we do that, with, uh, uh, our objectives were to understand the culture, go get into the culture and understand the surrounding and reach out to the people and uh, will understand also that a, a missionary job is not a 40-hour job. You clock in in the morning and clock in at, out at 5, but it's really not a 40-hour, more likely a 60, 70-hour job and it's, you're always on the call it's, and you do everything. You not do just preparation of a sermon, but you do setting up this church and doing children's ministry as well as counseling, as well as anything else, a home Bible study and whatever has to be taking place. So that would be a missionary. But the other obstacles you're facing in Germany and anywhere else in the ministry is you're in basically in enemy territory. You're in enemy territory. And I have to ask, when do I have to end? Right now? 10, 50, off. Okay. Get, the, get your pillows out. No, I'm just sorry. Uh, um, we face a lot of ob obstacles in Germany, in the ministry, but every missionary faces obstacles. That's why they go there. They go to the field because they know it's a difficult field and they want to penetrate the light the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light, guys. It is not something you just do on the side. You understand you have a plan and you execute that plan. And you're vigilant, you understand how to, how to overcome difficulties. But sadly, that is not something what everybody learns when they go in the field. They don't know how, to, sometimes don't learn how to have a, a team that is united and work together. Most of the problems on the mission field, what do you think, how they happen? It's, it's tension among the people, among the team that is sent out. That's the sad part. And we have experienced it and tried to maneuver through it. And in some ways we were successful, in other ways we were not successful. But one thing is, we have to understand that we are there, we are servants and we are slaves of God. We are not our own. We have not, you know, it's not like I want to have my 40 hours of study time and then go in the pulpit and teach, but I, I want, 
your conviction needs to be a different one. Your conviction means to, I do anything and uh, everything in order to serve the, uh, serve the church and really to, to start a ministry. And it might look totally different. The, the first time when we went to Germany, I went, was part of the local fire department in order to make relationships. And a few weeks later, they offered me to lead the whole use of that village in the fire department because I saw the way we I deal with, dealt with this. I mean, there are different ways how you go about to reach the people, but obviously it's always the gospel. Obviously it's always uh, with a goal to plant a church. So, in all human ingenuity of philosophy of man will not prevail. I mean, it has to ultimately be, you know, the, all the, the philosophies we, so we know from the world, we have to put them aside. And we know that we will be able, we need to fight those actually. You know, when you deal in Germany with humanism, and when you deal in Germany with um, evolution, evolutionary theory or whatever it might be and whatever the progress uh, of uh, human wisdom is right now, or the whole thing with gender uh, equality and stuff like this, you need to know how to dismantle that. You need to show them the scripture and say this is not biblical, and here that is the right view. You destroy the enemy's philosophies and build up the right philosophies. And that might take time, but, you know, God is a, uh, always working and he has been able and uh, he has shown us how he built the T, uh, EBTC and the churches we are serving with. It could be also misguided biblical teaching which you have to show that it's wrong. People, you come into a place and there are lots of people come from different churches and want to see what you're doing and stuff like this and you realize, oh wow, that teaching was wrong. How do you deal with Catholics? Some, probably a lot of you guys have come from different uh, church background, but how do you deal with that? How do you help them to understand the right thing? And we had, for instance, we have one guy uh, in his my age, actually, he came to the church, he was a devout Catholic, and then God has changed his life and turned him around, and now he's leading, actually, Bible study with his wife. And it's, it, it's amazing. So you have to dismantle all the different philosophies of man, the false religions. You have to under deal with Buddhism, and Hinduism, and Islam, Catholic, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, and Christian Science, all those kind of groups. And in Germany, in a major city like this, you get all of it and much more. If you as a missionary understand the opposition you will face in the ministry, and if you understand that the gospel is counterculture, People don't want to hear the gospel and counter values, a counter value system of the land, then you will be very thankful for the unique opportunities when you experience them. The unique opportunities to minister the gospel to the people. Take it. Don't, you know, every opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and help them to understand it, you take that opportunity because nearly every other person is against you. And the age group between 25 and 35 they, in, a, in this uh, a statistic was taken by uh, Chicago University. There was not found one person believing in God. Between 25 and 35, not one person believing in God. So they said there's zero interest in the God of the Bible and zero interest in any God. Think about this. This would not happen in India, in Russia, nowhere. They, everybody, there's at least somebody who believes in a, a God. But it is so secular uh, culture and it's so atheistic that they didn't find it. We, at the same time, most of our people come from that age group. So we know it's not true what they say. It's not true what they say. But what I'm saying is you have to expect opposition. And you have to fight against this opposition. So the unique opportunities we have to work in our ministry is just with a team that God has allowed us to build with EBTC and 
the Eckstein Gemeinde and now the Leuchtturm that actually three churches have been just planted within the last five years in Berlin itself, going out from the previous Russian German church in the EBTC. All of them, as I mentioned, our tr people in the EBTC, our leadership is represented from five or six different churches that are represented in the leadership and so on. But what we are just seeing is um, that we have, we have unique opportunities because we have a team that holds and believes and models Christ. And it's, it's just amazing. Um, I'm, I, I really, I love the guys. I love the team. We have incredible relationships. Um, and we understand that it's very unique and very, it's a gift from God when you think where we are. And we all believe that we have to do discipleship. We all understand the, new, the unique opportunities we have right now is to take people who come to us to the EBTC, we want to be trained and help them. We bring them in as interns, um, discipleship ministries in the church at the EBTC in order to really strengthen the church in Germany overall. And right now we have, I think, three or four guys. When you come, would come to our office, you see them there, and they work with the other guys together. They are at a couple days at the EBTC in the offices and with our training, and the rest of the time they are with one of the local churches and working along our pastors, who you most of you might know, Theo Friesen or Matthias Fröhlich or Martin Manten, myself, and a whole bunch of new other ones already. But what is the, this is just an opportunity we have, it's unique, you, you have a team that is building uh, and, and, and reproducing according to Titus and 2 Timothy 2 to um, um, the next generation of people. But the ultimate thrill is really seeing the fruit of the ministry. I mean, it's, you know, it's like here, you, you, you see new people come to know the Lord, but beside that, you see, when you see those people who came to know the Lord have families and they are Bible, you know, the, the, the way they educate the kids is biblically driven. It's Christ-centered. And when you see the fruit multiply from generation to generation, and, and um, Phil and I just talked about it, we are now in charge and we are, our responsibility is not to train our generation, but the next generation. And we have to think generationally. What is the next person doing? How do, do we really teach it in such a way that they can take it and teach it others? We have to produce material and, and, and discipleship groups that reproduce the others. And through the pandemic, for instance, we had amazing opportunities. I saw it as God's you know, God-given pandemic, sorry to say that, but it's, yes, people have suffered. People have even died. I, I don't, reje I don't, I understand that we have that right now. All my leadership, actually, that just sent me an email from the EBTC has COVID. So they are in bad, and we have to have alternative, you know, one church does it now, uh, Zoom at this weekend, but most of our churches were open, also the EBTC was the whole time open. Now, it, we were affected by it too, but I still see it as an opportunity because we had so many people come to us and wanted to be led and want to see the truth and hear the truth. People came to our church from Albania, Christian from Albania, Ernesto Henrico from Spain, Suleiman from Pakistan, Mark from Israel, Nick from India, and we have even some from Germany who came to the church since then. Just this representing, I mean, and so I can say this is a thrill for us. It's, I'm not a, sorry to say, I'm, yes, pandemic is bad. Basically, the masks are bad. I don't like them, you know. Just, uh, I was not born with that, so I don't know how to do that. I, sorry. <laughs> No, I, every time I use them in, for a long period, I get a headache because I think I, maybe I don't get enough oxygen. I don't know what it is, but I have every time a headache. So 
I, I really help the uh, pharmaceutical in industry to you, give you the mask so that you have to take other medication against it. But <laughs> I just, it's just a joke, please take it off. But uh, the, the point is, but what, we see, what, what do we see developing is that God allowed us to reach out to people who would never have looked for it. And this is the opportunity to stand up for the truth as a local church, as a missionary, and you know, as a, to focus on what God uh, has given us through this opportunity, the pandem pandemic, and we have become uh, lighthouses in the darkness. And this is true for the church in Switzerland, and Torbenthal with Martin Mann is true for the two church plants in Berlin, and also the other churches in, in the uh, Rheinland uh, Bibelgemeinde Overberg. All of them say the same thing and witness the same situation. We all need actually bigger buildings right now because we have outgrown the buildings. And this is it's a problem, but it's a good problem. And so what do I do to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel to make disciples of Christ? What is your part in it? How can you do it? How can you be directly pardoned? Of course you can support us. That's not the thing. But pray for the men and, the, and their families who you have gone out from here. Pray for them. Do you have a calendar or do you have a... I think you have a missions book, right? Missions calendar or whatever. Go through it. Pray for them individually. They need your prayers. They need your encouragement. Sometimes the wives on the field are lonely because they, they are with the children at home. They don't have the fellowship. They can't come just to church like this. Pray for their language learning, their culture acquisition and all what they need to do. Some of them need to learn, have to get a new driver's license. I mean, there's so many things you can pray for them. But also pray for them that they have their mind on God first, on his kingdom, and not on the secular things. They can be discouraging, but when you call them, just encourage them, not criticize them. Just encourage them, hey, Christ is on the throne. He is in charge. Do we believe in Matthew 6, 33, 34? Do we therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be, will be, uh, for tomorrow we will be anxious for itself, suff sufficient for the day that is, uh, I mean, that's sufficient without trouble. You can, we can trust God. We can seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, and he will add all the things to, to you. Help the ones who want to go to get ready to go. Who is here ready to go? What does it take? So get together and make them, help them to get trained, help them to get ready to go. Make them, um, invite them personally, find out what their needs are, find out how they, you, can, you can be part of the sending process. How can they maybe learn the language? How can you pray for the children to learn the language? Maybe you can be in contact with them on a regular base. Maybe you, they can, um, yeah, the other thing, what you can probably do, I don't know if you do short-term teams here, but you can go on a short-term team, build relationship with your missionaries on the field. They will not, they will be lasting relationship. When you see it firsthand, what they are doing, you will never forget them. You will never forget to pray them for them, and you will never forget to, uh, uh, to really be part of their ministry. So what I'm saying is try to be informed um, and understand those men and women who are going out. They are the real heroes. It's not the Hollywood stars. It is not the famous singers or the world's sports stars that are not the heroes the heroes are the ones who give their life to the gospel ministry Hebrews 11 talks about them of whom the world was not worthy just remember that I mean we get so excited about sometimes about the entertainment of this world and forget that people 
who are in the enemy territory and they need ammunition and they need food, spiritual food, ammunition, the truth, and just help them. The church is a model when it comes, your church is a model when it comes to reach lost. Don't give up the task. It is a great task. Pray for your missionaries and pray for God would send men and women into the harvest because the harvest is still incredibly great. Let me pray. Father God, it's in, in, indeed a privilege to be part of the body of Christ here at CBC and to see what God you have already done. We were allowed, and Sharon and I were allowed, and many others were allowed to see what you have done already in Germany and Austria and Switzerland and uh, see the fruit of the ministry. What a privilege, what a thrill uh, to see that. And, and it makes every investment worthwhile, Father. Thank you also for the faithfulness. and pray that you will keep this church faithful to the task and send out many, many more missionaries into the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you stay up here, Christian? Um, we have a few minutes right now to, if you had any questions for our brother. Uh, by the way, with regards to prayer, he did have some updated prayer cards on the back table just after the last row, so if you want to get an updated prayer card from the Andresons, and also a little brochure to just pray also for EBTC and just the ministry going on, and praise God for all the fruit <laughs> and good work being done. Walt, what do Influx of what? Muslims? Well, okay, I need more missionaries. No, the truth is the following. We see it as an incredible opportunity to reach the unreached world in our country. I can tell you stories personally about what we have already done and what we, are about, what we li would like to do, but we just don't have the manpower right now. Because you have to, people have to have men and women also who give the hearts to this kind of cultural group. Otherwise, it's very difficult to reach. And because they are in our country, we can reach them there, and they can go back to their country, which we could not do. Mm. Any other questions? Oh, I'm just going to repeat the question for the, yes. for the live stream. So if, does he see anything going on in Holland? <laughs> well, the, the border between Germany and Holland is there. You know, that's, um, no, I don't know very much. We have often on contact to the uh, church in Holland, um, but not much. Actually, I got a whole library from a missionary in Holland because he went back to the United States. But though, no, otherwise, we have not, to my recollection, much contact to the Holland, uh, the Dutch people. Um, I know that there's a strong Reformed church and there's a strong homeschooling environment in, in Holland, but that's all what I know right now. Yeah, sorry. That's a good prayer request, actually. For, pray for Holland. Yes, Dan. Uh, are most of the churches in Germany, are they uh, meeting in person, or what's the situation? Yeah. Um, well, so are most of the churches in Germany meeting in person? What's the COVID situation, basically? Uh, the restrictions are very similar to here, to California. We are not allowed to um, meet as previously in normal we have social distance and clean uh, and all the hygiene things and also mask using mask but you can meet with a certain number of people on a certain you know square meters according to us, how many people can live uh, stay in the church but most of the churches as far as I know have not met um, our churches have all been physically uh, have physically met and it's uh, as much as possible we had no problems in our area but in the Rhineland, Cologne area, there were some really challenging situations where there were actually um, media and police and all that uh, and, and interfered in church services and closed down churches. We know that, but my advice to everybody was always, 
work around the situation, work around what's happening and open the church. I mean, we, the first thing we did, I think was it in March last year, no, in March, April, in May probably, I think, or April, when we opened our church again, was a, a series of four, uh, uh, four week series on fellowship, biblical fellowship. Uh, sorry, the church is a fellowship. You can't ch change it. I'm sorry. It's anonymous. Man. You can't just pull the leg away and say it's not, it's functioning. You have to be together. So that's my conviction. And I'm sorry, that, that's all the conviction of the EBTC. Even when they have COVID, they said, whoever, you know, you can still meet and we don't want to be spread as we, uh, that's not the goal. But nobody has yet in our vicinity died directly from COVID. Indirectly, yes, because of other situations. Yet, right away, three people, who, two people who took their life and one person who um, died basically because he was um, alone, too long alone, and he couldn't fight the... He had a, a surgery and he was not strong enough to fight the, the follow-ups of the surgery and the family couldn't visit them and so he passed away. But just saying that, is, is we are very convinced that the church so, should stay open as much as possible. Obviously, you have to be careful, all that taking into consideration. Mm. Maybe Chris, oh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So how, is they, how, how have they, as a church, kept focused on making disciples? How have you led in that, Christian? Yeah, I'm not the only pastor. We have, a, uh, we have three elders, and they are all pastoral elders, and we have seven men working right now together. And you know Mar uh, Marco was most recently, he just left, but all together, we were always focused on discipleship, everyone. We have a list. We go through every person in the by, uh, in the in our congregation and pray for them, for the also for the guests, on a on a regular basis. And and we uh, have a um, we want, we we look where they are, who is discipling whom, and how we can further them in the understanding of the gospel and in the maturity in, of faith. So there's a plan for basically when you come into the church, we try to bring you to maturity in Christ and to the full, full manhood. So it's just ingrained in everybody. It's not one program. It's everything. Everybody thinks that way. Even with the kids. The program starts with the little kids and goes to the oldest people. And yeah, there's no one program. Sorry to say that, but the Bible is a program. <laughs> and we have to bleed it that's what I say. You know, if somebody cuts you, it needs to come Bible out, not blood. I mean, you understand that? Yeah, you understand. That. Good. All right, brother. Maybe you could just specifically share some specific ways we could be praying for you right now. A lot of wisdom. I have a lot of, uh, Sharon, I have a lot of uh, responsibility of just mentoring and shepherding the younger couples. And um, not everything is easy. And there are some challenging situations on the, f on the European field, but also on the German field. And we just want to be there for them. And uh, to, we have all children. We have eight grandchildren. There's also a lot of work there. And that's probably our main focus. So to learn what it means to be uh, grandparents <laughs> in a positive way, you know. Uh, to just be there. I mean, that's basically it. Wisdom and Christ-centeredness in all what we do. Yeah. Amen. Well, why don't we pray for them right now? Yeah. All right, thank you for our, our brother, Christian and sister, Cheryl, and just uh, even what Christian was talking about, just how missionaries can give up even in a short time. But So we praise you that they've remained faithful and are continuing to do the ministry after so many years, and we just lift them up to you, Lord, that you bring fruit to their efforts as they try to disciple these young people in the church as they continue to uh, teach and administrate and encourage the brothers and sisters there. Lord, may they uh, just have that enduring strength, 
Lord, and not grow weary, not lose heart in doing good, and that you, you would do a mighty work there, that you would continue to grow the church, save people from every language, even there in, in Berlin, and, and continue to use the school, Lord. Thank you for that. With the new students, that there's hundreds that they're training right now, Lord. It's what a wonder. I pray that they would just work hard and continue to learn your truth and that they would take your word into the different districts and cities there in Germany and that there would be more churches planted and that thank you even that they're having problems fitting the saints into their buildings now. I pray that you just continue to provide for their ministry uh, and continue to even burst the buildings, Lord, for your glory. Bless us as we enter the worship service now. May you be praised in Christ's name. Amen.